video, Matt here. Hope you're doing really well. And I thought today we could dive in to some of my previous races, talk through um, how I was mentally in those positions, sort of maybe how the races uh, either went to plan or didn't go to plan, the sort of expectations leading into them compared to the results that we uh, achieved. Um, sort of my mindset mid-race, you know, anything like that that I think maybe you can benefit from. Well, I hope you can benefit from everything that I post. Um, but maybe you can relate to these uh, particular circumstances and, you know, understand that, like, us, we, we are no different to you, you know. At the end of the day, a World Cup, an Olympic Games, a World Championships, you're still racing from A to B over a 2,000 metre course, you know. It, you could be at Met or Marla Regatta at Dorney Lake. Um, it's still the same process. You're still lining against some tough opposition. And, um, you know, we can all go to pretty dark places from when that green light goes to hearing the buzzer at the finish line. Um, so maybe some of the stuff that I say in this video could resonate with you. Um, and if it's something you haven't maybe thought about, then maybe it can help you if you're in a tough spot mid-race at some point. So let's jump into it. The first race I thought I'll pick up on was actually my sort of my debut of stroking the men's four. And this was at the second World Cup at Eton Dorney. Um, we were on the furthest lane uh, from the grandstand, so we were closer to the finishing tower. As you can see, the conditions were sort of a, a cross tailwind. And for those of you that have raced on that lake, you know that along that bank, there's a little bit of shelter, but then there's parts where it opens up where you've got bridges. And there's sort of three of those along the course, I think. Um, and so you can be rolling along, nice smooth conditions, and then you, suddenly you'll get hit by sort of a gust of wind. Um, but leading into this event, we'd only raced sort of once before, and that was at the Australia World Cup, where we had a slightly different lineup with Noddy at stroke, and I believe um, Alan and Scott were the other way around as well. I'm, I, from memory, I can't quite remember. But yeah, we were lane six. You had Australia, New Zealand, Romania, Norway, and China. And, um, you know, as you can see, the whole start process was taking forever. And there was actually a point where Noddy in the... Uh, in the two seat, actually put his hand up and said, oi, no, wait, stop. And actually told the umpires, like, you guys need to do a quick start. Like, this is stupid. We're being blown across. And you can, from this clip, you can see how strong that crosswind is blowing our bows over. And the start marshals were just taking so long to start us that our boat was just kept getting blown. So it was pointing into the, the uh, Australians' lake uh, to our right-hand side. Um, now the reason we got lane six, which was the most beneficial lane, is because we actually won our heat. We beat the um, New Zealanders who are in the middle lane, um, and I think for this, this was all, this was our first A final performance together in this crew. Um, myself, Alan, and Scott, we were all very very new to sort of the British rowing um, team. Um, this was all our first year, and. Um, you know, this is our first chance to get out there and see how we could get on, I guess. Now, we actually had a good start. Um, back then, we had, a pretty we had a pretty decent start or a pretty decent finish. Um, a lot of the time, we could bolt the two together. Um, we lost a little bit of pace through the middle because we used to try and get out the blocks so fast. Um, in this particular instance, we had a very good sort of first 250. And then we sort of tried changing up tactic and just sort of keeping it loose. We knew that there was going to be a bit of a crosswind. And so we knew that if we could just sort of stay loose and deal with that better than the rest, then we could get more efficiency, we can get more length, we can get more power per stroke. So moving through 500, we were in third place. Um, I never wanted to look at the boat. We had Scott and Noddy making all the calls from the bows. And my job was to just try and set up the best rhythm I could. Um, and sort of in the mix of the race here, we came through 500 in third place. Um, I'm always of the mindset of if someone's ahead of me, then maybe today they're just that little bit better than me, um, or they're overcooking it and I'm going to make them pay for that as the race unfolds. Like if you're a length up of me through 500, then you're hurting and I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that I close that gap and I'm going to make you regret getting, going out of the blocks that hard. So for me, it's very internal. It's like, right, am I settled? Okay. I've got out the blocks hard and fast. We've found our rate, we've found our rhythm. Now I've just got to stay as long as I can and just keep each stroke flowing one into the next. And I know that if we can find that good rhythm and we can stay relaxed and not let the conditions get the better of us, then we can put together the best 2K row that we can. All too often you see crews battling with the conditions and they never quite lengthen out. They always look quite tight in the upper body. They're very sort of reactionary. 
they don't sort of let the conditions happen. You've got to really stay loose. You've got to trust the process. You've got to trust the training. You need to trust your crewmates. You know, you need to still work as one unit, even in the worst of conditions. You can see it's actually very choppy, the water. It's not nice. It's not flat. It's quite turbulent. There's quite a lot of clipping. Some crews might be catching crabs, clipping buoys, clipping water. So you really got to think about how you sort of extract the blade and how you place the blade. And you want to minimize how much you're clipping the water because every clip can upset the boat. Every clip can almost slow the boat down. You don't want to check it. You want that boat to keep moving forwards. And you've got to try and keep internally. You notice no one is looking out the boat at this point. Noddy's in the two seat. He's sort of keeping us in check. He's letting us know, okay, we've moved through into second place. What we're doing is working. We don't need to go any harder than this. Trust the process. So now here, we're moving, we've come through the 500 in second place. And this last 500 is where I love to sprint. I'm a good sprinter. Um, some people may think that I hold a little bit back through the middle to um, maximize my sprint, but I enjoy it. It sort of works in my favor. I'm quite an explosive, dynamic athlete. So I can take the rate up quite quickly. And um, sort of, I'm quite strong on the, on the leg exercises, the back squat and the leg press, things like that. So I can really put the power down when I need to. And I feel like I got quite a good gear change. So I enjoy the last sort of 250, 500 meters. And at this point, you can see we're gradually pushing the rate up, but we're holding the length. We're holding the rhythm. We're staying very internal. We've got Noddy telling us where everyone is. For me, I can now see out of the corner of my eye that we are up on the Romanian crew and that I just need to keep doing what I'm doing and we can just move away, move away, move away. I had no idea how close we were to the Australians. Um, you know, was there another gear in there? I'm not sure, probably not. But, you know, for me, having this as sort of our opener together, that was a huge um, sort of confidence booster for us as a very new crew we didn't have the best start to the the first world cup in australia we managed to come fourth out of four we lost the two australian fours and one new zealand four and that new zealand four was the same one that we raced here and you can see what a, a simple crew lineup can do in sort of adjusting the results you know none of us were rowing any different we just found a new lineup that sort of benefited us in the long run you know it felt more comfortable it felt a bit more natural we all were working towards our strengths and bringing our strengths to the crew to help the crew grow stronger um, and we made a huge improvement there and that sort of set us up for the rest of the year the rest of the year was all about building off this performance so the next race we're coming to look at was the second world cup of 2015 in Varese and for this regatta I was in a coxless pair with Callum O'Brighty um, again, we were a very new combination. Um, this was my first race of the season. I had been out for most of the winter with the virus. So this was my sort of first taste of racing again and sort of Jürgen testing me to see if I, if I could sort of still live up to the previous year. Now, the year before this, in 2014, um, we had just won the World Championships in the men's eight. So for me, I was sort of coming into this season as a world champion. That was my first taste of sort of a gold medal at the senior level. And that was really sort of inspiring me to, well, like, I want to do more. I want to sort of, I want to prove that gold medal. I, I don't want it to everyone to think that, that maybe that's a fluke and we got it as a one-off. You know, we all worked incredibly hard for that result and everything came together on that day. And this year in 2015, following on from that, I wanted to sort of cement that confidence and show that I am a world champion and uh, I, I can keep replicating those performances. So for me, this is my first chance. We, we'd had a tough World Cup because we were both very new to this. Callum was very new to British rowing as well. I'm, I think this was his first year with British rowing, his sort of first season where he's got in there. He's a big, strong guy. I was pretty unfit and so you're trying to bring sort of the two of us together for a bit of experience. Um, I think we had to go through the reps but we won the reps and then in the semi-finals we came third which is why we're now in an outside lane. We managed to scrape through to the A final and sort of sitting in here you know we had nothing to lose. We weren't expected to win a medal. Um, you know I think we were expected to make an A final because at that time with British rowing and still now, you know, you always go into every event with the expectation of making an A final and then trying to secure a medal. So for us, we ticked the main box, which was make the A final. And now, you know, if we got a medal, then, you know, that's a big bonus. But I remember sitting on this start line and, um, you know, the tension was high and I was, I was sort of really G'd up. You could tell that we we're both very, very up for this race. Um, you could really feel sort of the aggression. We're both very 
you know, you could feel like we were both tuned up, we were both ready, and we really wanted to put down a marker. Now, as you'll see, we went a little bit too far the whole aggression thing. So when you're in a race and you're really pumped up and amped up and people are like slapping their legs and hitting the boat, you really need to be able to control that energy and release it in a controlled manner. You don't want to go hell for leather, fly or die, because you will pay for that over the course of the 2K. So what we always say is that you can't win a race off the start, but you can lose it. And this particular race, I will show you how you can lose a race off the start. <laughs> so we are the boat on the far side from the camera. And as you can see, we get out the blocks really well. We've got a really high straight rate. We've got really good boat speed. And, you know, I actually felt really, really good at this point. And I was like, this is good. We can keep this going. Let's keep going with this. Like I was nervous energy. I was like thriving off that. And I, I wasn't controlling it. I was sort of full of adrenaline. And you know, you're just like a mad animal. You're sort of blind. You don't feel the lactate just yet. Um, and so you're just like, right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. So you can see everyone is starting to come down on the straight rate. Even the Italians and the Australians are sort of coming down to 40, 41. Now those sort of nations are known for being very high raters. Um, British rowing, we're more sort of a length and power focused nation. So we don't tend to rate particularly high. I think in this particular moment, we would usually be trying to come down to sort of 37, 38 on the rate, but we're still up at 40 because we're moving away and we're high on adrenaline and we just want to keep going. We had a very good start. We wanted to continue that momentum and we weren't thinking about sort of the second the third and the fourth 500 we were just like let's just keep going <laughs> so through 500 we're in the lead we've got about half a boat length i think like 1.2 seconds and um, now we're slowly starting to pay for that quick start you can see we're starting to get a little bit tired uh, it's starting to get a little bit hard work. I still think it looks good, and I think it does look good. We've still got very good boat speed, but you can see everyone else, they transitioned. They didn't worry about us shooting off. They had their transition. They found their race pace, and that's where sort of the efficiency and the fluidity of the rowing really comes into its own. So now coming through 1,000 meters, you can see how much we've paid for that quick start. We come through 500, clearly in the lead and within 500 meters we had dropped sort of four or five seconds in speed whereas everyone else went out a little bit slower and they were able to maintain that pace we went out super fast and then died off super quickly and fell from first place to third place and as this race unfolds we dropped back into fourth place fifth place and i think in the end we actually ended up coming last but you know it was a lot of fun and um, we definitely learned how to pace a start better after this. And the next race we actually did together was the third World Cup in Lucerne. We raced in the Coxed pair and we actually won that. So that was great. So the next race we have, uh, it comes again from 2015. And this was the World Championships in Aigbelet in France. And well, I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> That's how I always pronounce it. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful place to race. If you ever get the chance to go there, even a training camp or a competition, I would highly recommend it. You know, you've got stunning scenery, beautiful water, the surrounding area is perfect for spectators, and it's just a, it's just a really, really nice place to, uh, to visit. Now, we've been very dominant in this Cox pair. Now, on the previous video, you saw that I was with Callum, and me and Callum actually raced together at the third World Cup, and we won that. But leading into the World Championships, there was a bit of a switch up. And now I'm in a pair with Noddy, who was my two man in the very first race from our uh, 2013 Coxes 4 at Dorney. So now you've got me and Noddy in the Cox pair together with Henry Fieldman coxing us. And leading into this event, we've been very dominant throughout the entire regatta. So I knew that we were going to win this race. But I also knew that the only thing that would stop us from winning the race is by either myself, Noddy or Henry making a mistake. And that was more nerve wracking than knowing that we we're in for a fight. You know, knowing that, okay, I know I can win this as long as I don't make a mistake. And so you're sort of trying to micromanage everything. And I think in that position, you can almost overthink the situation and just make things harder than they need to be. But thankfully, you know, it all went to plan and we had a very good race. Um, and this was just like a really good experience. It was one of the last times the Cox pair was actually um, raced at World Championships. So this was 2015. This was sort of the regatta where all the boats were being selected for the uh, Olympic Games. At the time, the Cox pair, it wasn't an Olympic class boat class. 
Um, it hadn't been for a little while now. The following year, uh, GB won the Cox pair again with Callum and Ollie uh, at the World Championships. And then the following year again was the last year that they raced the Cox pair um, with Tim and Tom at the Sarasota World Championships in 2017. So, so this was three years out from them getting rid of the Cox pair, which is very sad. I think it's an, it's an amazing boat class. If, if you've had the opportunity to compete or train in a Cox pair, you'll know it's very different to any other boat out there. It's incredibly heavy. I'll say on the recovery, there's almost two checks. There's the check where you and your pairs partner sort of set your body weight to start the recovery. And then there's a, another check from where you sort of pick up the Cox. So it's almost like you finish the stroke, check, check, roll into the front. And you know, you come out of the Cox, uh, the Cox's pairs and the eights, which I won in the previous year, where they're so fast and they're so boisterous and energetic into one of the slowest boat classes in rowing. And now our training partner leading into this was Alan Campbell in his single, because we were both very similar paddling speeds and we're very similar at racing speeds. Now, again, in this particular race, we had a nice, good, clean start and it was just about being patient, sort of let the boat do the work for us. You don't want to overwork the stroke. You know, the boat wants to go in a straight line. The only thing that's going to stop it doing that is you. So you just need to do your part, get the boat up and running, and then give the boat as much time as you can to just keep running. And you want to pick it up without checking it too much. Now I keep saying check, and check is where you look at the stern of the boat and it will bounce up and down. And that bouncing is you stopping the run on the boat. So you want to minimize that check by how you arrive in and change direction. So you want to come in light on the foot plate, you want to place on the way forwards, and then you want to change direction without disrupting the boat. You don't want your body jolting around, rolling around, grabbing it with your arms. You want to come in soft and push out, come in soft and push out, just to cough, sort of keep that stern, just moving, minimalizing this big old check every time you see it. Some crews, you can see their sterns almost going under the water. That's because they're coming into the front incredibly heavy and trying to change direction too aggressively. So it's a, a very fine detail. You've got to really time it to get the most out of the boat. So by this point, we're coming through a thousand meters. We're in a commanding position. And it's always great when you come through halfway in this position and you know you've paced it right, you've got another couple of gears to go and you're in control. You're controlling the race, you're con controlling the crews around you, you're making them wanna chase you, you're making them get tense, get tight and start fighting amongst each other. You're at the front, you're surveying the rest of the field and you're sort of, you're making your calls, you're keeping it loose, you just need to keep ticking it over, keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. Everything you've done up to that point has worked, so why would you change? And as you can see on the screen, you've got the different bars. It's like a bar chart next to each nation. The light blue shows the crew that is the fastest moving boat at the time. So at no point over this race did anyone overtake us. We were always the fastest moving boat, which is, which is another thing that makes this race so fond in my memories. Not only look at the water, it's perfectly flat, it's sunny, like it's beautiful racing conditions, but you're in this amazing boat class that not many athletes have been able to experience in a commanding race, you're just going through the process and you know, this is the last race of the year, so make the most of it. Coming through 500, you know, we're in a commanding position, we managed to open up clear water on the rest of the field and again, this is my favorite part of the race, the last 500. I love sort of turning the screw a little bit, lifting the rate, pushing the speed on and seeing now, you know, we've done the job, we either hold on or we can think about it and we can nudge it forwards. Now at this point, you know, we wanted to nudge it, so we pushed the speed on a little bit. We didn't make too much of a jump in the rate. You can still, we're still at 36, 37. Everyone else starting to lift up to 38, 39, 40, as they're all sort of fighting over sort of the silver and the bronze medals. And we're up front, we're quite relaxed, we're very chilled, we're keeping the rate low because we want to keep the length, but we're squeezing the legs, we're squeezing more out of the boat, we're lifting that boat speed. You can see we've got 250 meters to go, and we're in command. We haven't lifted the rate, but we're still the fastest moving boat on the field. We're letting everyone else fight it out for the rest of the medals, and we're just sort of trying to cruise towards the finish line. So coming through to the finish line there, you can see we're in our commanding lead. We take the gold medal, and it was just a really, really sort of cool situation to be in. You know, I had won the world championships the previous year in the men's eight. This particular year, I'd spent the winter out of a boat. I had had a virus. And for me, it was great to come back in, win another gold medal, win my second world championship title. 
off the back of not, not a perfect year, you know, I spent half of it ill or injured and I really had to work hard to come back, earn my place in the lead sled and then go on to win the World Championships. And I was lucky enough to share it with Noddy and Henry who are great people to have in your boat. They're really tough guys, they're so knowledgeable and they're really calm, cool and collected in any race situation. So to have them behind me, backing me up, supporting me made the world of a difference leading into this sort of leading into uh, this regatta. Me and Henry have gone back years. We've done a lot of under 23s together. Obviously Noddy and I had raced together in the eight the year before and the four the year before that. So we'd had a lot of racing experience together. We sort of knew how each other would think. Um, and I just think it was great. And I think finishing this year and winning this World Championships by this margin, which was the biggest winning margin of the event, was just sort of the icing on the cake. And it made me really look forward to the year ahead, the top 2016, the big one, the Olympic Games.